Welcome. We will now be learning page 27 of Sota. We're already uh, 26 pages in, more than halfway of the learning between Pesach and Shavuos. So we have a statement here that Shmuel says that a person should rather marry a woman herself who is a very promiscuous and maybe she is uh, not being faithful to her husband, but rather marry uh, uh, a person. She's not married yet, I was talking about a person who is uh, promiscuous and maybe being with a lot of people rather than the daughter of a promiscuous woman. Why? Because at least a promiscuous woman came from a proper marriage. They were, they were faithful to each other. But the daughter of a promiscuous woman, who knows who she was with? And, and maybe wasn't even a Jew. And who knows what it was to so rather not marry a daughter. There's actually, the Rabbi Yochanan argues, and he says the opposite. Marry the, the daughter of a promiscuous woman who, is, who, who conducts herself properly and not a promiscuous woman. Why? Because the daughter of a promiscuous woman is still uh, 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 in, uh, in good standing, but the other one is definitely not in good standing. So we, we, there's a little bit of discussion, and we finalize that ultimately it's better to marry the daughter, look at the person themselves, their condition and their conduct, rather than where they come from. Why? Because most, even people are promiscuous in, in, in marriage, they're most of the time they're with their husband. And therefore, their children, we say, go after the majority, it most probably came from their husband. Obviously, these were the days before DNA, and uh, in courts, DNA don't, in Jewish courts, don't stand up very strong generally as well. So, um, so the Gemara says, um, what happens, ask the question, what happens if she was very promiscuous? Meaning that we can't even say that she was mostly with her husband. Most probably she was with more people even while she was married than with her husband. How can you say most of the intimacy she had was with her husband? So we say like this, it depends. There's a discussion when a woman becomes, uh, is, is, a, is the greatest moment to become pregnant. Is it right around her time she has uh, she menstruates or is it right around the time she goes to the mikveh that's 12 days after she menstruates if it's around the time she, she menstruates the husband doesn't necessarily know when that is so he can't sort of keep an extra eye but it's around the time she goes to the mikveh the husband knows when that is and therefore he can keep an eye and make sure um and make sure that everything is uh, as good so the Mari says we, we remain with the question do we say this rule always and a married woman, even though she's promiscuous and maybe going to be with other men, we say most of her relations are with her husband, therefore her children are kosher from the marriage, or do we say, or do we say not? So now we'll, we bring down another part of the mission. The mission says that there's times the best in that the Jewish court it, it does the, the warning on behalf of the woman. When is that? So we said when it's uh, the wife of a um, Someone who can't uh, hear, someone who's uh, gone off his mind a little bit, uh, uh, someone whose uh, husband is not in town, someone whose husband is in the is in the uh, in the prison. So we say that the bezdin is allowed to warn uh, the wife, but what's the purpose of the warning? He can the, the bezdin cannot actually give her to make her drink if two people saw for the, the if a witness saw or two instances saw whatever the, the 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 whoever's opinion it is that she was uh, went into a room with hiding with the person she was warned against they cannot give her to drink because only the 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 wife uh, the husband can give her to drink it says the man will bring his his, his wife but there is an opinion that says that the uh, uh, there's opinion that says the Rabbi says that, yes, the husband, when he comes back, he can give her to drink based on the Bezdin's, the court's warning. But the other opinion holds that only the husband, if he warns, he can give her to drink. Or if someone else warns, he cannot give her to drink. Then we learned um, when the Torah and the talks, of, uh, it says, Isha, Tachas Isha, it says a man, uh, um, uh, um, uh, the husband is, uh, uh, instead of the wife. So, so it puts the husband and wife in the same verse. And from here we learned something interesting. What is that? That uh, if, just like uh, if he was uh, blind, he cannot give her to drink. It says he has to see. 
So, so too, if she was blind, she doesn't drink. So meaning all the laws that occur for him occur for her. So he's blind. He can't give her to drink. She's blind. She doesn't they, they drink. Um, just like if she was uh, limping or she was missing uh, an arm, arm was cut off, she doesn't give a drink. So too, if he was limping or was missing an arm, he cannot give her to drink. Uh, these are technicalities. And just like if he was, uh, if she couldn't speak, she couldn't say the words, she cannot drink. If he cannot speak, she cannot drink either. So this finishes off the uh, the the third uh, chapter, the fourth chapter of uh, Sait. And now we begin a, a, a mission. It's quite a lengthy mission uh, for this page learning. So we say like this very fast. Say, what's with the guy who she was with? So now we talk about the husband. The woman, what about the guy she was with that's the cause of all this problem? That says, when the water, if they actually did something, when the water checks her, it checks him as well, meaning he dies at that moment as well. But it says, a bow, there's twice uh, well, that will come, the water will come into them. Into who? Into both of them, the woman and the one she had the relations with. The same thing, just like if she does not drink. She's not allowed to be married to the husband. She has, he has divorced her. She's not allowed to get married to the one she was with either. Either, um, Even if she doesn't admit that she did anything with him, and even if she admits for sure she cannot be with him. This is what Rabbi Kiva says. Rabbi Yeshua says like this, um, that uh, the same exact thing, but from a different way that we learn. Then the Mishnah brings, Boy Bayan. Maybe even that day, Rabbi Akiva, this is not even connected necessarily to the uh, the, the laws of Saita. But it's by that day is a famous day. There was a day Rabbi Gamliel, who was the leader of the Jewish people, was removed from his leadership because he was very tough. He didn't let people come into study unless he felt that they were really at a high level and sincere about their learning and about their righteousness. So many people were left outside and they weren't able to come study. So that day they brought in Rabbi Lezer ben Azariah as a very young new leader, and he opened up the doors and everybody came in. And on that day, many, many, many laws were clarified and discussed. And so it's bay bay on that day. And it seems like even the law, the discussion of Saita, that we just had now in the mission, it was also happening on that day. So they bring the, on that day, uh, Rabbi Kiva taught us that it says that a, a earthenware vessel, earthenware vessel, it's different than any other vessel when it comes to Tumah that uh, it, 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 most things become to may contract Tumah, the, become defiled by contact. Earthen with vessel comes not by contact, but by the content inside. The content inside, that's what makes it uh, tummy. So it says, something that falls inside earthen with vessel, whatever is inside of it will become tummy. So it doesn't say becomes tummy, it says we'll, we'll be able to give over more Tumah, more, more. Uh, uh, um, uh, defile something else. So we learn here that, that that the vessel becomes what we call the first level of impurity. The, the thing, whatever's inside of it, becomes the level, second level of impurity. And that second level of impurity can make can defile even another piece of the food, whether it belongs to truma, to the uh, to, to to something that's holy, or whether it belongs to even to regular food that's not has, doesn't have to be eaten a certain by the kohenim a certain level of holiness. So Rabbi Yeshua said, Rabbi Kiva, Rabbi Yechon Mezake once said that uh, one day, because there's no real substance to say that something that's inside of that earthenware vessel can now defile a, a third thing, so that someday someone will come and prove that it doesn't get defiled. But the truth is, Rabbi Kiva doesn't learn it from some deducing, he learns it clearly from the verse, and, and, and therefore, Something, the earthenware vessel is level one, the food inside is level two, and it can defile something else, level three. Another thing that happened on that day, Rabbi Kiva uh, was uh, teaching, it says that outside of the cities of the Levites were given certain cities in Israel, because they didn't inherit the land. It says outside of those cities, um, in one verse it says they were given 1,000 amma. now amma is a cubit, about 18 inches. One place says they were given 2,000 amma. So what does it mean? They were given 1,000 uh, times 8 inches or 2,000 times 8 inches. So he says both measurements are important. 1,000 amma means outside of the city, they were given empty space, open space. And then 2,000 amma means that you're not allowed to walk on Shabbos more than 2,000 amma outside of your, outside of a city. So that's what it brings both of them down. 
Um, the other opinion of Lezer, the son of Yosek, really says that what thousand Nama was migrash, was empty, it was nothing, there was nothing there, it was, it was it's like ra- raised grass, raised grass, raised grass. But in the outside, uh, beyond that, the second the th- a thousand Amma, there there were fields, fields and orchards, etc. There, there was a lot of bee there. So this way, the animals don't uh, run out of the uh, out of the place because there's nothing to go there for the first thousand Amma. Another thing we learned that that there, Rabbi Kiva said that it says that then Moshe and the Jewish people when they crossed the sea, they sang this song, saying. The question, what are you saying? All the Jews were together. Usually in the Torah it says that Moshe spoke, Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, say to the Jewish people. But here, all the Jewish people were together. So who is it saying to? So from here we learn how they sang the song according to Rabbi Kiva. That Moshe sang, and the Jewish people sang a chorus. Just the same way you read Hallel in a minion in the olden days. So he read most of the words. The Chazer reads most of the words, and they read a little bit of a chorus. So Moshe read everything. The Jewish people just said the chorus that Ashir al Hashem go, I'll, I'll, I'll sing to Hashem because he's very exalted, very high. So therefore it says, Lamer, the Jews were repeating after Moshe. And the Chenny says, No, it's like we read the Shema. When you read the Shema in the Minyan, someone starts and everyone reads together with him. So the Jewish people all had prophecy. And, and when Moshe started to sing, the prophecy uh, came on to all, into all the Jewish people and they sang together without anyone teaching them the words before they sang together. Another thing that we learned on that day, by Yoyim, so Rishua, the son of Hurkin, it says, there's a discussion about Eom, Job, which Job is one of the books of the holy books. It talks a lot about his suffering and his faith in God. See, he said that Eom served Hashem out of love. So, like Eom, you know, expressed that I love him, even if he kills me, I love him. But we're not sure... What does it mean? So we're not sure if, if Eov is saying that even though Hashem will kill me, I will love him anyways because I love him so much. No matter what he does to me, I love him. Or he says, I love him unless he hurts me, then I won't love him. So we find elsewhere in another verse that he says that even the worst things happen to me, I will still love God. He told his friend, I will still love God. So we see that Eov served God out of love. Rabbi Yeshua says that in the name of Yechlem and Zakkai, that he says that actually Eov served God out of fear. He had fear that he was, he, 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 was, he had the fear of heaven, the fear of God. Um, and he served God out of fear, out of fear of what can happen to him, um, the punishments that will come from, to him, etc., etc. But the mission ends off that we already said clearly proof from verses that he served them out of love, uh, not out of fear. So this ends the page for 27.